now we're on. Well, come on in. We're going to start the message. Hope you're really well today. Let's start by praying together. We thank you, Father, for this church. We get to gather together on a Sunday. It's absolutely amazing to do our best to belong to each other in the same way that the Father and the Son belong to each other, that we can be unified here as a church. We just thank you that every time we gather, we're encouraged and something good happens. That's what we pray for today, that we can open your word and be changed. We can be set free in some part of our hearts, some part of our lives as a result of reading the word. And we pray as it goes out, it does not come back fallow. It doesn't come back empty-handed. We just thank you for that and pray, God, that no matter what I say, no matter what kind of sermon this is, that the Holy Spirit would preach a better one. We just thank you. We dedicate our time to you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So I just want to say thank you to Matt Reiner. Matt, you sung a song today about resting in the mercy of Christ. Uh, John Gross shared Psalm 13, and he talked about trusting in the loving kindness of the Lord. Both those brothers set me up well today. We're going to talk about similar themes. I want to talk to you this morning about something that I think has been the greatest encouragement to me in the past several months as I've studied it. And I hope the same is true for you. I want to share about the heart of Christ, the heart of Jesus Christ, and how Jesus feels about sinners and people who are suffering. There's a few reasons I like to do that today. The first is that I want to take some time to help anyone who is experiencing a very particular kind of fear. I think from time to time, we all get this idea in our heads, and it's this idea that if you're a Christian this morning, that God is mad at you or maybe distant from you, that he's disappointed in you, that somehow God is punishing you for something you did or something like that, I think every single person in this room has been there. There's many things that can make us feel this way. Maybe you feel insignificant in your life. Maybe you can't sort out your emotions. Maybe you feel misunderstood. It's possible you're in physical pain. It's possible that you are dealing with some sin that keeps occurring in your life, and you don't know what to do about it. Maybe you can't stop doing a certain thing. Maybe you can't stop overeating or getting angry or looking at porn or whatever it is. Every, everybody here has a thing. Maybe your thing isn't that thing, but we all have something. And so we have to ask a question this morning. We have to ask how God feels in the midst of it. How does God feel about you? Is he there to comfort you or is he there to accuse you? I want to do everything in my power this morning to convince you that Christ's heart for you is gentle, that he is merciful and compassionate towards you, and that he, he has mercy on you despite your sin and in the midst of your suffering. Now, Jesus Christ has many attributes, but the one I want you to leave convinced of today is that the heart of Christ is merciful to us. That's my primary point this morning. And so, no, that's not a bold statement, ladies and gentlemen, but it's just a simple truth that we need to remember more often. Christ is merciful to us, his body, his church, his sheep, and his attitude towards us is to love us, to heal us, and relieve us. So in the Bible, the heart is described as the center of someone's life. It's the center of your will, your emotions, your desires. When we're talking about the heart, we're talking about who somebody is in their deepest part. We use phrases like heart of hearts. We use phrases like the heart of the matter. So when we talk about the heart this morning, the heart of Jesus Christ, we're asking who he might be in his most essential, right? And so there's many attributes to God. Of course, God is righteous. Of course, God is holy. But he's a God of justice and wrath. So even though the Bible says over and over that he is those things, the biblical witness also says that he's gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. It is easy to feel like it's the wrath of God that's spring-loaded for the Christian. But the thing that's pouring out of him most easily is not wrath for us. It's mercy. I'm sure we've all had that experience of feeling far from God when we sin, but our sin does not make him go farther from us. It brings us closer. It brings him closer to us. And I want to show you that today. I want to convince you about how he feels about you. Maybe change just some of your thoughts about him, especially in the midst of your burden, especially when you're feeling weary. Perhaps you've heard of a man named A.W. Tozer. He said this. He said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. 
So it's worth it this morning to make those thoughts the best, the most lovely thoughts that we can. So let's get into our text. I, I'm going to read Matthew 11. This is verses 28 through 30. These are the words of Jesus, and I hope you hear them. He says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the first point I'd like to make this morning is that Jesus wants sinners to find rest in him. So if you're burdened today in any way, Jesus wants you to come to him so he can give you rest. He is saying that the only requirement for coming is that you feel burdened, right? He didn't say, come to me when you got it all figured out. Come to me when you got the right answer. Come to me when you feel better. He said, are you laboring right now? Are you burdened right now? That's when you come, right? Come to me in the midst of your troubles. It's not so he can punish you. It's not so he can shame you or point his finger at you. It's so he can give you rest, right? Now, why would he do that? Because he says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. In me, you will find rest for your souls. Let's talk about that a bit. What does that word gentle mean? The Bible has that word four times. It has a few synonyms. A synonym is meek. In the Beatitudes, Jesus said it's the meek that will inherit the earth. Another synonym is humble. In the Gospel of Matthew, it records Jesus' triumphal entry. And Matthew says this. He says, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. And finally, Peter encourages wives to have a gentle and quiet spirit. So if you take the sum total of what those four verses mean, it's talking about Jesus, and it's saying that he is not harsh. He is not reactionary. He's not a guy you're afraid to give bad news to. He's not going to fly off the handle. He's extremely understanding of you. He is ready to embrace sinners and people who are suffering with open arms. He's saying, come to me right now and don't wait. You have nothing to fear. So yes, he's gentle. He's also lowly. Paul tells us in Romans that we should not be proud, but instead we should associate with the lowly. Now, who are the lowly people of the world? In Jesus' day, they were the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the lepers, and beggars. Those are the people he chose to associate with. So when he sees suffering, he moves towards it. He comes down off his throne, and he comes out of heaven to be with people who are in need. And what does he say next? He says, take my yoke upon you. So the yoke is a metaphor for the law. And he's saying, don't be yoked to the law, to keeping the law and being perfect. That's not a burden that's easy or light. It's heavy and impossible. Instead, he's saying, be yoked to me, right? So being yoked to Jesus is light because he is a place for sinners to come and find rest. To find someone to learn from who won't ruin them, but instead will heal them. A better way to say it would be that Jesus' yoke is a yoke of kindness. And in that kindness, we can find rest. So Jesus said a lot of astonishing things in the New Testament, right? He made claims to be God for crying out loud, right? So this is the master of the universe. But what he said about himself in terms of his heart is just as astonishing, Right? He, didn't, he didn't say that his most basic admission about himself is that he is high and mighty. He's not powerful and exalted. He himself says, I'm gentle and lowly. That's amazing. If you had to say just one thing about who Jesus was, this wouldn't be a bad summary. I think this would honor his teaching pretty well. So according to his own testimony, he understands sinners like you and me, and he goes out of his way to be with us. This is not how we naturally think of God, and it absolutely should be. So all of us have read the New Testament and learned about what Jesus did. But there's only one place in the gospel records where we learn about who he is, where he tells us directly about his heart. He gives us a view behind the curtain, behind what he did and a picture of why he did it. So why did Jesus come to earth to live as a man, to do ministry, to suffer and die and rise out of the grave because of what's in his heart? He saw suffering people and naturally desired to be gentle and lowly towards them. This is the heart of Jesus Christ, and it's available to anyone who would come to him. Let's talk about another 
aspect of this. The second point I'd like to make today is that Christ's heart is not repelled by sinners. In fact, it wants to relieve them. So our part is to come to him. When we have a burden, we go to him. His part is to receive us gladly because there's something in him that's moved to help us, to cure us, and to heal us. When Jesus sees sin and misery, when he sees suffering and deep human need, he has a reaction. And that reaction is a desire to provide relief. He experiences tenderness. The New Testament is full of examples of Jesus' heart in action. Over and over, we see his heart described as compassionate, right? He saw crowds and had compassion. Seeing the helpless, he had compassion. Feeding the hungry, seeking the sick out, teaching the ignorant, he had compassion. There's two times in the Gospels where Jesus openly weeps. One of those is when Lazarus died. One of those is over Jerusalem. So some of the deepest misery he personally experienced on this planet was seeing the suffering of other people. So mercy is not primarily an action that Christ does. It's also an emotion that he feels in his heart. There is not a more pure heart in all of existence than the one we're talking about right now. The heart of Christ is the utmost in purity and holiness, and it raises a question. This is the question. If Christ is holy, doesn't he have to withdraw from sin? I thought because of God was holy that he found sin revolting. He won't go near it, right? So here we are. We're talking about how actually Christ goes towards sin. So how do we reconcile that? It is true that the holiness of Christ finds evil revolting, but it's the same holiness that draws his heart out to help sinners and to relieve them. So what's the difference between the two responses of God? The difference between the two is that God gives one response to his children and one response to his enemies. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then God's holiness results in kindness towards you. If you exist outside the body of Christ, then Christ's holiness results in wrath. So part of the reason there is a need to give a sermon like this is that as believers, we often expect the second response from God, not the first We know more than anyone else that God's wrath could have fallen on us. We are conscious of our sin. We still have sinful programming, and we know it. So it's easy to feel like God is angry with us. But just because God is holy doesn't mean that he's severe. doesn't mean he's sour towards us. In our humanness and our fallenness, I think we project on a Jesus. Imagine being rich. It's really easy to look down on the poor If you're beautiful, it's very tempting to look down on the ugly. If you're exalted, it's easy to look down on despicable people, unclean people. That's just naturally what we do. But holiness doesn't work the same way, does it? Is that how the heart of Christ functions? Not at all. I think the more pure in heart, the more drawn to suffering. So holiness And purity of character should rightly result in the hatred of evil. And we see that in Christ's response to unrepentant sinners. But it also rightly results in sympathy for suffering, which is displayed in his kindness to the church. Now, this theme is throughout the Bible, but I want to show you this morning just one passage in the Old Testament and one in the New. Hopefully you'll see what I'm talking about. The book of Hosea, chapter 11, verses 7 to 9. God says this, My people are determined to turn from me. Even though they call me God most high, I will by no means exalt them. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger nor will I devastate Ephraim again. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. So here we find God's people sinning against him, turning from him. And it was not his anger that was aroused. It was his compassion. He did not ultimately exercise wrath on his people. He desired mercy for them. So yes, he may punish. Yes, he may exact justice, but all with a goal in mind of returning his people to himself. He wants to gather chicks under his wings like Jesus longed to do in Jerusalem. This is not just a theme in the Old Testament. We see this in the New Testament as well. 
Consider a few examples. Jesus said to be holy like the Father is holy. He calls the Father holy, but he also says the Father is compassionate. Peter calls Jesus the holy and righteous one, and yet the heart of Christ is gentle and lowly. What about the Spirit of God? The Bible says the Spirit of God is holy, and that the Holy Spirit is called another comforter. Who was the first one? It was Jesus, right? Let's read from Ephesians 5, right? Consider Christ's heart as we read this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. So Jesus Christ wants to make his church All of you, you and I, radiant. Every sin, every spot, blemish, or wrinkle is being washed away by his mercy. So when you come to God with your burden, he does everything in his power to rid you of your sin and to wash you clean. You are his body. No one hates his own flesh. So a little audience participation if we can. Did anybody get hurt this week? Did a body part you have... Maybe you get a cut or a scrape. Anybody in here? Ben Wynette, what, what part of you got hurt? I stubbed my toe. You stubbed your toe, okay. Now, uh, did you clean your toe in any way? Okay. Did you protect it in some way? Did you bandage it? Paw Patrol Band-Aid? Are you going to make your toe work as hard as it would normally, or are you going to give it maybe time to heal? Does it need time to heal? Right. Anybody else? And postal weight. So you had a cat scratch you. Now, did you clean that cut? Did you bandage it? Are you protecting it in any way? Okay, and do you need to give it time to rest in any, any way? Okay, right? And more people have the same experience. This is what God wants to do with you and your sin, Right? Clean it, bandage it, protect it, give it time to heal. Christ wants to see his body healed. It's not just good for the arm or the leg. It's good for the whole body when he heals a part. Right? Let me use another example. God forbid maybe my daughter Nora gets cancer. That'd be terrible, right? But here's a question. Would I hate her or would I hate the cancer? Hopefully you see what I'm getting at. I wouldn't blame her for having a disease. I would do everything in my power to rid her of it. And if she were sick, I know that my heart couldn't help but explode. I would feel for her. There's no way I'd be angry with her. Any anger I felt would be aimed at getting rid of her cancer, right? So if your kid has a disease, you're not adversaries. We're on the same side of the fight. I'd be on her side. Same with you in your sin And it's the same with your relationship with Christ. You and God are not on different sides of your struggle. Picture for a minute, you have God on one side and you have you on another. You and your sin are on another and God is fighting you and your sin. I think that's the reality that most of us feel. But it's not actual reality. Actual reality is you and God and God has removed your sin as far from you as the east is from the west. You're on the same side in the fight And you and him are waging war against your sin, against your flesh. That's how we should think of this. So please remember today that Jesus is on your side in your struggle. He wants to heal you, to cure you, to relieve you of your sin and suffering. Not leave you in it, not abandon you, or forget you. Right. So I'd like to make one more point this morning. That is this. There is joy in the heart of Christ when we repent. We've answered two questions this morning. If you have a burden, what do you do? Well, you go to him. For his part, what does he do? He heals you. And there's a third thing that happens. You come, he comes. Both of you together can celebrate. So what is his attitude in repentance? Think about that for a minute. When Jesus says, come to me, you can't come to Christ without admitting that you're a sinner. Repentance is a change of heart. It's a change of perspective. The change of perspective when we go to him is the admission that we can't help ourselves. 
We need to stop trying. So we did this for the first time upon accepting him as Savior. But we continue to do it when we realize we're holding on to things that we need to take to him and let go of and drop. When we repent, the heart of Christ rejoices. I think it'd be easy to assume, it's easy to feel like, well, all I really do is avoid his wrath. Not true. In fact, you enlarge his joy. Consider this, just a fictional example. What if a doctor went into a jungle to give medical care to a primitive tribe? He flies equipment in, he diagnoses the problem, he prepares antibiotics. Maybe he's wealthy, he doesn't need a salary. He just wants to provide care to the afflicted. But maybe they refuse. They want to take care of themselves. They want to heal on their own terms. Maybe finally a brave young man steps forward and he says, give me what you got. Would that doctor feel resentment at the other villagers for not coming? Would he be angry with the one young man who maybe took too long? He wouldn't be angry at all. Jesus Christ feels joy when we come to him, right? Christ gets more joy and comfort, I think, than we do when we come to him and ask for help and mercy. So when you come to Christ, and you approach the throne of grace and your heart goes out to him and you say, this right here, my sin, I truly hate this. Can't believe I did this, said this, felt this. I need your help. Jesus, please help me me. He wants nothing more than to do just that. Your heart in that moment to present that to him, in your heart of hearts, you're saying, I hate this. It goes with his. It unites with his heart. It goes with the deepest wishes of God, not against. Consider what Hebrews 12 says in verse 2. It says, Jesus Christ is the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. So, Jesus died on a cross to secure our eternal forgiveness. We know that's true. But that work of atonement that he did on the cross made it so that we can go to him for daily forgiveness as well. We need an ultimate forgiveness, that's true. But we need momentary forgiveness, continued forgiveness along the way. We repented one time to be saved, but we're going to repent a million times as we sanctify. So the joy of Christ got him to the cross, but his joy didn't stop at the cross. It continues every time that we come before him. Our repentance draws on the joy that started at the cross and continues now. And what was that joy that Christ had? It was the joy of seeing his people forgiven, brought back and made clean, made whole, He wants us to draw on that strength and find joy in his love and his forgiveness all the time, every day. The only people that can do that are sinners in need of undeserved love. That's you and I. Sinners who see that the heart of Christ is mercy towards them and people that want to come. Consider what the Bible says. Jesus talks about joy. He says there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents the 99 who need no repentance. He said he wants his joy to be in us and our joy to be complete. He said this, he said, I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. So he wants our forgiveness, he wants our repentance, but more than that, he wants us. He wants our hearts to be full of joy because of his mercy. And make no mistake, Every time we are carrying around a burden that we should let go of, that we should bring to him, the heart-to-heart connection is severed from our end. Every time that we notice it's severed, it doesn't mean we're in trouble. It doesn't result in wrath. It means we come back to him and we reignite joy. We continue the relationship. And it's his joy and ours to do so. So Jesus had incredible joy in our forgiveness, and that's because of the mercy in his heart. It's because of that mercy in his heart that desires our healing. So the mercy and compassion of God for you this morning, they are endless. They do not run out. You can have as much as you need if you will only come to him. 
So I hope all of you in your heart of hearts that you hear that today. You can come to him. You will not be rejected. He wants to heal you. He said, all who come to me, I will never drive away. Think about that. He will not cast you out. Even if you're a big fat sinner, even if you're hard-hearted, backsliding, even though maybe you're bringing nothing good with you, he says to you, I will not cast you out. You may be tempted to dismiss that. So let's do our best to rid ourselves of every possible objection. You may say, I've really messed up. I've got secrets. My past is sinful. My present is sinful. I don't know how to break free of sin. My burden gets heavier all the time. It's too much to bear. Jesus doesn't understand. And despite all this, he's saying to you today, come to me. So Jesus loves you. He wants to heal you. You can come to him and lay your burden down. Let me ask you, are you a lukewarm Christian in some area of your life? Are you backsliding in some area of your life? Are you not obeying the voice of conscience in some place in your heart? You can come to him with your burden today, right now, and begin to be healed. But you can't hold on to it yourself and expect any change. Maybe you're a little different than that. Maybe you've never come to Christ before in your life. You can come to him and experience forgiveness for the first time today. And who wouldn't want to come to a Savior with a heart as beautiful and pure as the one displayed in Jesus Christ? He says his heart is gentle and lowly. So if you find your heart leaping in your chest this morning and crying out for a king who is perfect, For a Savior who's pure, you can have him today, right now. If you need the help of Christ this morning and you've recognized that Jesus is the only place that you can find rest, do not leave without talking to someone. Jesus can be yours if you will simply lay a hold of him. Repent and believe that he can heal you. He's a great prize. He's worthy to be made Lord of your life. And all around you here, everywhere in this sanctuary is the family of God want to help you and treat you just like he would. So if that's you this morning, you've been overcome by mercy, we'll pray for you in just a moment. But we'll end our service now by turning to the person next to us, sharing a thought, journaling, maybe praying, and we'll close in prayer in just a moment. Well, Father, we thank you that you're chasing us down with mercy, with goodness and mercy all the days of our lives. We thank you that mercy exists in the heart of Christ. For the ability gained through the cross to come to him and find rest, we thank you for it. That you take care of us as you would your own body. And that when we repent for the first time, or the one millionth time that you find joy in that, that your joy can be ours. We just thank you dedicate our Sunday service to you. We want to lay our burdens down at the foot of your cross. Celebrate your death until you come. Just thank you we can gather as a church today. We pray in Christ's name, amen. All right, God bless you. Have a God week. See ya.
Thank you. Appreciate that.